and thanks very much uh, for the invitation. It's really nice to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you, actually, about the um, very interesting relationships that Ireland has with both of these two countries, China and, and Germany. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the, um, this uh, Report that was mentioned that uh, I and a colleague wrote on the on, on the special relationship as we as we called it between uh, China and Germany, um, which um, came out in um, I think May 2012, um, and the genesis of it was this was um, you know I guess it was the the high point of the Euro crisis in a way. Um, and we were I remember having a sort of an internal debate uh, within ECFR about uh, whether the Europe that was emerging from the crisis was a German one or a Chinese one. Um, because you, on the one hand, you had this debate about German power that was, that was, um, that was taking place at that time. Um, at the same time, you had this uh, attempt by Europeans to try to persuade China to um, buy European sovereign debt, for example. Uh, and there was, there was lots of um, debate at that time about, um, the, uh, about the increasing Chinese presence within Europe, as it were. Um, in fact, my co-author uh, for this um, report, Jonas Prillo plesner uh, also co-authored another report, which I wasn't involved in, called The Scramble for Europe, which was about um, Chinese investments in, in Europe, both in terms of sovereign debt but also in terms of infrastructure and buying into companies and so on. Um, and so you had these two clearly very important countries, China and Germany, for, for the future of Europe. Um, but there was always also this um, very interesting, it seemed to us, relationship between them. Um, that weirdly we thought nobody in Germany was writing about, which is kind of an interesting thing in itself, I think, which has, and I think this has something to do with the, um, the way that uh, Germans uh, are slightly reluctant uh, to even talk about a German national interest or a specific national relationship um, that Germany has with China. So even though you had lots of German think tanks that were working on China, they weren't really shining a light on this bilateral relationship. They were all working on EU-China relations. Um, so, um, so we thought that this would be an interesting subject for, for us to look at. Um, and so um, when we started to, to look into this a bit more, um, we thought that the term special relationship um, made sense. Um, we, this was particularly, what we particularly had in mind was um, the uh, so-called government-to-government consultations um, that, uh, that began in uh, 2011. This is in effect a joint cabinet meeting that the German cabinet and the Chinese cabinet uh, now have on an annual basis. Uh, and Germany has this type of arrangement with lots of other countries. It's a, it's a German format um, with, with countries that it considers important. Um, but the interesting thing about it is um, that China doesn't have a similar, a similar setup with any other country, including with the, with the US. Uh, and so from the Chinese side, the fact that they were prepared to do this was an expression, it seemed to us, of how important the relationship with, with Germany was, was to them. Um, and, and, and hence this term special relationship. And we were thinking, I mean, obviously, the, the, you know, when you talk about a special relationship, you, you immediately think of the relationship between the UK and the US. But we also had in mind other relationships between individual member states within the EU and countries outside of the EU. So, for example, France and Algeria or many other sort of colonial relationships. We weren't thinking specifically about the UK-US relationship, and clearly that is in many ways very, very different from the, the Germany-China relationship, not least because of the shared values that you have in the, in the special relationship between the UK and the US, which isn't so much the case in the Germany-China relationship. Nevertheless, we thought that it made sense to... Um, to use this term. Um, and what happened when the report was published, as I say, in, in May 2012, was that there was unanim un unanimous rejection of this term uh, in Germany. I can remember that we had a, uh, a panel discussion at the Dutch Embassy uh, in Germany uh, when it was uh, launched, and there was a panel of four Germans, uh, one from the, the Social Democrats, one from the Christian Democrats, in other words, two politicians, uh, an official from the Foreign Ministry, and somebody from the business community. Um, so a very kind of broad range of Germans, and they all rejected this term. So it's completely inappropriate to talk about the special relationship between China and Germany. Um, false alarm bells was the, was the quote that, that from that evening that kind of stuck in, in my mind, that, that essentially we were um, exaggerating the extent of, of this relationship. Three months later, uh, in August of 2012, um, Angela Merkel visited Beijing, and we were amazed to see how um, uh, 
within three months, the Chancellery itself had adopted this term, the special relationship, and was, and was, was trumping up, actually, the special relationship between China and Germany. So you had this um, spate of media coverage um, in August, um, all of which used this term, the special relationship, sometimes referring to our report, sometimes not. But um, it was just remarkable how, within a very, very short space of time, what had seemed very controversial um, uh, actually seemed to have become a commonplace. Um, so I feel as if this report has been sort of um, vindicated, to, to be honest, and, and in particular some of the trends um, uh, that we identify, I think, have accelerated actually in the, in the two years since, since we wrote it. Um, and so I would argue that this relationship is, is as special as ever. Um, this year we have uh, Xi Jinping is about to um, uh, visit Germany at the end of, um, at the end of March. Uh, which, as I understand it, will be the first of three meetings between Merkel and Xi this year. Um, there is this very intensive relationship um, that's continued uh, with a new leadership that's taken over in China. Uh, and I think the other thing that's happened in the last couple of years is that the implications of this relationship um, have become a bit clearer. Um, and it, it's gone in actually a slightly different direction to, to, to the things we pointed out in the report. Um, so what I want to do in the, in the next sort of just next ten minutes or so is to is to very very briefly um, describe um, the nature of this relationship and in particular to talk about it from the German perspective but also from the Chinese perspective because I think the two sides see this relationship in, in slightly different ways um, even though they talk about a win win relationship um, and then as I say to talk a little bit about the um, the implications of it um, for Germany for Europe and for the West. Uh, and in particular to try to put um, it in a bit of a global context because I think, as I say, one of the other things that's happened in the last two years is um, that um, some of the global trends that were happening uh, have, have accelerated and, and, and become a bit clearer but also we have, um, I think we're increasingly aware of the, um, of the security uh, issues in East Asia uh, and I want to talk a little bit about how I think the China-Germany relationship plays into that. Um, so, first of all, I mean, I think the place to start in, 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 in talking about the relationship between China and Germany, at least from the German end, is the economic relationship. Um, we talked in, the, in this report about um, an almost perfect symbiosis between China and Germany. Um, essentially, uh, China needs uh, technology and Germany needs markets. Um, and that's been the basis for this um, economic relationship that's grown exponentially um, over the last um, decade or so. Um, and that, in turn, I think, has to be seen within the context of the sort of structural shift in the German economy that took place from the 2000s onwards, uh, where uh, the German economy, which always had been um, uh, a, a very export-driven economy, became even more dependent on exports than, than, it, than it was up to that point. Um, and... Uh, and so, um, uh, for example, nearly 50% of GDP now comes from, from exports in, in Germany, which is an extraordinarily high um, figure, especially for a country of, of Germany's size. It would be one thing if you have a, a very small country like Never the Netherlands that, that exports that, that high a proportion of its GDP. But for a country the size of Germany, it's, it's quite significant, I think. Um, and... Um, and then, as I say, on the Chinese side, there's a, a need for technology, and in particular in the, um, the fifth 12-year, um, um, sorry, the 12-five-year plan um, uh, that, was, uh, that was published, I think, in 2011, uh, there was this uh, decision to uh, focus very much on moving up the value chain um, to shift away from export-led growth uh, to, more, uh, domestic, to increase domestic demand. Um, and uh, to um, develop more uh, innovation internally within China. Um, and so Germany is a crucial partner for that in terms of uh, particularly, I suppose, two sectors of the economy where um, Germany does um, very, very well and, and that the Chinese see as sort of strategic um, sectors of the economy, which are on the one hand um, in, you know, machinery and, and in particular machine tools, um, which is obviously a business-to-business -business, um, uh, sector, and uh, I suppose on the other hand, the automobile industry, where um, German exports have have gone through the roof in the last um, in the last ten years or so. The uh, China is now the largest market for the uh, Mercedes S-Class. Um, and uh, th I think this goes for for the German automobile industry in in general. Um, 
so it seems to me that um, what's happened is you have a, a, an increasing um, dependence, uh, an economic dependence uh, on, on China uh, in Germany. Um, and I think um, this, um, as I say, at the moment, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, an almost perfect symbiosis, as I said, between China and, and Germany. But there is, um, I think, in the future, some potential for conflict in that relationship. And there have been a few moments over the last few years that have kind of hinted at the possibility of greater conflict between China and Germany. In particular, in 2010, there was a dispute about uh, German access to uh, Chinese rare earths. Um, that dissipated... Um, uh, but then you've, you've also had, within the last uh, year or so, I think, uh, a, an apparently coordinated campaign in the Chinese media against German uh, automakers, uh, which was interesting, particularly because it included Volkswagen, I thought, which, um, which had spent a very long time uh, investing in not just uh, in China, but in relationships in China, manufacturing in China, doing all the things that, uh, that it's often said you need to do in order to... to uh, to, um, to have a strong uh, relationship um, with your Chinese stakeholders. Um, and yet they, along with Mercedes uh, and, um, and uh, uh, BMW, were also a target of this uh, campaign, which kind of showed, I think, how fragile, actually, um, the, um, the position is of, of these German exporters in China. Um, and then thirdly, and, and probably most importantly, you've had this dispute um, in the um, last 12 months over solar panels. Um, uh, and I think that illustrates, um, I mean, a couple of things, but perhaps most importantly, the way that um, the way that Germany, the German exporters, are coming under increasing uh, under increasing pressure from Germ from Chinese competitors. Uh, and solar panels was a was a sector in which um, Germany was the world leader just until just a few years ago, and has essentially now almost completely lost that sector to to Chinese competitors. Um, and to, to the extent that uh, apparently um, uh, ger the German government no longer thinks that it's worth even trying to defend that sector because it's long gone, um, and so instead would prefer to uh, try to protect um, other sectors like the automobile industry, which in the longer term um, might have greater chances than having a fight with the Chinese over, over, over a sector like solar panels that has, it, it's already lost. Um, anyway, I think those things just kind of illustrate the potential for... for um, conflict in future um, and the final point I want to make on, on just the, the, the economic relationship is that clearly the balance of power in the relationship is shifting every day in China's favour as they move up the value chain um, and need German technology it seems to me less and less um, Germany I think is going to have incre is going to have less and less leverage in that relationship um, it's already, it seems to me, I won't say too much about this, but it seems to me it's already started to, this, this economic dependence on China has already started to shape German preferences in some ways. So I think it is becoming harder and harder for German, German, the German government to talk about human rights. Um, uh, there is still a lot of pressure on the German government to do that, particularly from the media in Germany, I think. But um, it seems to me that the German government is increasingly constrained on this type of stuff because... Uh, because of its economic dependence on China. Um, so that's the relationship from the German end, as it were. Um, and let me just talk briefly about how I think it's seen in China. Um, and that will, that will bring me to um, the sort of broader implications of, of the relationship. Um, when we went to China to research this um, report, um, we met with, we spent a week or so in, in Beijing meeting with officials and analysts, and um, we, in each case, would ask them about um, how they perceived the euro crisis, how they perceived, in particular, the, the big three member states within the EU, um, and the sort of the general message that emerged was you have a you know strong Germany, a marginalised UK, and a weak a weakened France, and, and so there was this kind of sense from from uh, Chinese interlocutors that uh, Germany was an increasingly important partner, um, and um, that um, as one of them put it, if you want something done in Brussels, you go to Berlin. In other words, you bypass the EU institutions. Um, and, and go to Berlin. And, and this seemed to be the second phase of a shift that had already begun in, in, in Chinese perceptions of Europe, around about 2005, um, when um, apparently uh, uh, 
the Chinese decided that um, the, they, they had until that point placed a lot of faith actually in European integration um, uh, but after the rejection of the referendum in the Netherlands uh, and, in, uh, and in France on the new EU constitution um, the uh, Chinese seem to have somewhat changed their mind about um, the direction that European integration was going in and, and seemed since then to have focused more on member states rather than on the EU institutions, which they sort of slightly downgraded, it, it seems to me, in, in their perception. And then this second phase that seems to have begun since the Euro crisis uh, started, uh, which is that rather than focusing on the member states in general, Berlin is the, is the, is the, is the place to, um, to focus on. Um, anyway, so we spent an hour or so with each of these interlocutors talking about this type of stuff. And then at the end of um, the hour, um, they would say to us, now can we ask you a question? Um, and there are, I know there are some people here in the room who know a lot more about China and, and, and how this works than, than I do. My impression is that's when you get the really interesting stuff, is when they ask you that, that question at the end. Um, and it's always a very uh, it's sort of carefully chosen uh, question. And in nearly every case... And as I say, this was in the spring of 2012. In nearly every case, that question was, um, what, um, what do you think about the US pivot to Asia, and what does it mean for Europe? Um, and the question that um, was implicit, um, and one or two of our more candid um, interlocutors asked it explicitly, um, was, if there's a conflict between the US and China, whose side is Europe on? Um, and what that um, suggested to me is that, and this you know, makes total sense, um, is that um, in, t in Chinese foreign policy, the highest priority is China's own neighbourhood, um, and in particular the um, emerging strategic rivalry uh, between the US and China uh, in East Asia. And we've seen that particularly in the last couple of years becoming, you know, the tensions increasing around the East China Sea, around the South China Sea. Um, and everything else follows from that. Um, and so, you know, it's true that there are some Chinese economic interests in Europe and in Germany in particular. Um, as I mentioned, China needs technology. Um, there is also an attempt to uh, diversify um, Chinese uh, currency holdings away from the dollar. Um, and so they do have a, a, a direct interest in, um, in keeping the euro, uh, in, 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 in the euro becoming actually a reserve currency. Um, however, it seems to me that th both of those things are secondary to this strategic interest um, in, um, in what's going on in East Asia. And if you start from that um, uh, starting point, then I think the relationship with Germany starts to look a bit different. Um, because um, above all, um, and, and this, is a, this, is, this, is, um, this is not a secret, this is something that the, China, the Chinese talk about um, publicly, um, they have this idea of multipolarity. Um, above all, it seems to me, what the Chinese don't want is a united West, um, particularly one that intervenes all over the place. Um, uh, and so they have this idea of multipolarity in which Europe plays a key role and the idea is essentially to, uh, to kind of detach Europe from the US um, and then the idea, I think the ideal scenario from a Chinese point of view as I understand it is that Europe, that Europe is sort of an independent actor that perhaps triangulates between Europe and, and, um, uh, and the US um, and um, if you listen, when we listened to the way that these analysts talked about German foreign, foreign policy more broadly, in other words, not just in terms of the Euro crisis and, 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 and um, Germany's European policy, but foreign policy more broadly, and particularly this question of, of military intervention, for example, um, it, we did start to wonder whether um, actually part of the um, special relationship from the Chinese perspective is um, not just a pragmatic response to increasing German power within the EU, um, but also a sense that uh, on some of these key questions, uh, Chinese and German preferences are actually more aligned uh, than um, uh, China's preferences to, with, with, say, the UK or France. If you think particularly of these military interventions, you know, from the Chinese perspective, as far as I can tell, um, 
uh, you know, Britain obviously is just a sort of a slavish uh, follower of the US, um, and you can forget about Britain. Um, France took the right stand on Iraq, but then on Libya, you know, now France seems to be the new US intervening all over the place. Um, and uh, whereas Germany, on the, hand, on the other hand, consistently, albeit for very different reasons, um, has opposed military interventions. Um, and so it seems to me that from the Chinese perspective, you have these three kind of uh, reasons why the relationship with Germany is very, very important. Um, on the one hand, this sense that, uh, as I say, this kind of pragmatic response to, um, to increasing German uh, power within the EU. Secondly, though, this uh, sense that um, the balance of power is shifting day by day in China's favour. In other words, this is a relationship w where um, China has a lot of leverage and in future will have even more leverage. This is a very useful relationship from that perspective. And then thirdly, um, a perception that, um, if I can slightly uh, uh, end in a, in, a, in a provocative way, um, that strengthening Germany is the way to get the Europe they want, which is one that is um, prepared to stand up to the US, and in particular that won't, um, that, that won't get involved in territorial disputes in East Asia. Um, last two sentences. Obviously, what's happened in the last couple of years since, the, since we wrote this report, as I mentioned, is that these tensions in, in East Asia uh, have, have, have increased. Um, and I'm increasingly imagining, um, uh, as I say, I, I, I'm no longer focusing even so much on the, the um, dangers of this relationship to Europe, but to the West more broadly, and increasingly imagining a situation in which you have uh, a crisis, um, uh, whether it's uh, over Taiwan, or whether it's um, over the Senkaku, Diyu Islands, or whether it's something in the South China Sea. Um, and um, Europe will be put on the spot. Um, France and the UK have been trying in various uh, ways, minimal ways, to increase security cooperation between themselves and uh, other powers in, in East Asia. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, it doesn't seem to me as if um, uh, European military assistance will be, um, will be asked for. Um, but it seems to me perfectly possible that um, Europe would have to take a diplomatic stand. Uh, and in a way, what I'm scared about is that um, Europe is uh, split um, right down the middle, as it was, for example, over Iraq. Um, but also that if um, Europe were to sort of adopt a position of nervous neutralism um, on an issue like this, um, then it's not really clear to me anymore what the, what the West means, if anything.